Welcome to the Numerologist Podcast, where we bring you a very special guest every single week to help guide you on your spiritual journey, live with abundance, and inspire your soul. Hi, John. Thanks for joining me. Hi, Rose. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Excellent. So I just want to jump straight into this and, and get to know John Holland. So yes. let's let's look at how John Holland, as he is today, came to be. So let's look at your childhood first. What was your childhood like as a, uh, a, gif- a gifted child? Um, well, I'm, I, I, it's the same story I tell. It's the, uh, I was raised in a Catholic family, one of five kids, three boys, two girls. And I was always the different one in the family. Um, like many of your listeners probably too. Um, what does that mean, Rose? I was very sensitive as a kid. I was a colicky baby. Um, I was very sensitive. Um, I spent a lot of time by myself. I, um, I basically was born drawing too, never took a class. So that was, you know, I was very, very creative. Um, I knew things that I couldn't possibly have known either. I was always fascinated by subjects like um, anything that had to do with spirits, religion, um, ghosts. Uh, psychic powers, or back then in my day, it was called ESP, right? Mm-hmm. So I was uh, excited about those things. Um, I was excited about religious movies. So, I mean, you know, not your average thing for a little boy, you know? So my, my, I wasn't outdoors playing sports with my brothers. I was either drawing or reading. Um, I was fascinated by chemistry. So it seemed like science, religion, spirituality. So I was always the different one in the family. And I was born with a highly a uh, highly tuned sense of uh, intuition or psychic ability. I knew things I couldn't possibly have known. Um, who was going to come to the house unexpectedly? Um, who was sick in another state? Um, I, so things would come out of me and my, uh, you know, and my dad would say to me, you, you, you know, or to my mother, something's, something's, diff- something's wrong with him. So, you know, with society too, if you're even then, um, if, some, if a kid is different, made to feel different, we hide it, Rose, right? We hide the ability. So I didn't want to be different. Not only was I different that way, I was skinny, big ears, a patch on my eye. So I was kind of like, yeah, I was really, uh, you know, really different. And so I hid the ability or I pushed it down. Only my friends knew that I could do this as I grew up. They knew I was fascinated by the subject. They say, do that thing that you do. And I would just give them a, tell, tell them about something that just happened in their life. And then an automobile accident years later, so I still kept it a secret or pushed it down and I didn't just come out and tell people. An automobile accident made those abilities even stronger. And you know, Rose, I have to change it. The, the, the accident didn't make me psychic. The accident was a wake up call for me and I got my life together. When I got my life together, I think I became aligned, all right? Like a Kundalini awakening. And that's when all this ability started to just, um, it was really, really heightened. I felt this energy inside me. And I was just, I mean, I could see things, feel things. I didn't know what was happening. Luckily, I had some education about psychic ability. So I, I am a big advocate of, I had no problem uh, being psychic. How do I shut it off, right? So I, I studied everything I co- can on the mechanics of how this works. Chakras, auras, meditation, breath. I had to know that. Then I started getting into Reiki, into healing. Um, and then little by little, little by little, I didn't quit my day job. Um, I kept it for years. I started reading tarot cards mm-hmm. um, at an aromatherapy shop and I started to do pretty well at it. People started to get to uh, know me there and, and I started getting a name, still kept my day job. And what happened was two years into doing psychic work. Now Rose, most of your audience, I assume knows there's a difference between psychic and mediums. There's a difference. Every medium is psychic, but not every psychic is a medium. People are like, well, what do you mean? When, you, when you're linking with people on the other side, they are using their, if the transmission or the reception comes through my psychic centers, whether you're clear sentient, clear, clear audience or clairvoyant. So you have to have, you have to be psychic. We all are, first of all, some are, have a higher potential. And um, two years into doing reading, something different happened. I am reading cards and this woman I'm reading for, her name is Mari, I'll still remember. It's in my first book, Born Knowing. She wanted to know about her career, her art, where was it going? It wasn't really just a prediction thing, just a little help on her, her schoolwork and her art where I saw you know, where, what, what was developing. And while I was reading for her, in my mind's eye rose, or beside this client, she was a young girl, I saw an elderly woman and her clothes didn't match. Now it's not like the movies, all right? It's not like this, you know, like a mist cap. And it was like, I knew she was there, but she wasn't there, okay? It's, it's kind of hard to explain. I, her clothes didn't match. 
And she was just pointing to our diamond, just this older, older woman. And I said, and I'm looking at the woman, I'm looking at the client, I'm looking at the woman. I said, Mari, there's a lady beside you. Her clothes don't match. No, don't know. I don't know why I noticed that. I said, her clothes don't match. And um, she showed me a diamond ring. Well, she screamed. I screamed. She got up and hugged me. I hugged her and I said, what was that? And she said, my great aunt Ada, who helped raise me, was colorblind. There's the clothes. And she said, the diamond I'm wearing right here, John, is the ring she gave me that I inherited before she, I mean, when she passed away. So I said, okay, wait a minute. So what is this? So what, and then it started to happen more and more. Every time I went to do a reading for someone, in would come their relatives. And I didn't just take that rose, but think about it. This happened, if my first book came out in 2000, this happened about 20, 20, over 20 years ago. There wasn't a lot of mediums. There wasn't a lot of books, yeah? So I believe in synchronicity, Rose. I believe that when you follow, I'm all about the soul and all the abilities. When you follow what your soul's trying to tell you, doors open. So I read every I read every book I could on mediumship in Los Angeles. All the books that I could find were old books from England, the spiritualists in England. Um, even though spiritualism started in the states, England when it went to England, it just it stayed there and it took you know it went big. Um, and I said, gee. And they were these old books of mediums' lives from days gone by. And I said, wow. I, it, I wasn't really reading how to. I wanted to know why is this happening? How do these people live their lives? How do, they, how do they deal with this? So two weeks into reading the books, I'm at a party. I step on a person's foot. And remember, I did say, if I could only go to England and study with these people. Mm -hmm. Two weeks into uh, reading these books, I'm at a party. I step on a person's foot. Where are they from? From England. And they were like, and uh, I stepped on this person, this guy's foot. He's like, hello. And I said, oh, are you Australian? Are you Irish? And he's like, oh, I'm British. And I said, okay. And I, I started talking and I got invited over. He had a space and one thing led to another. And that's when it all started. I went over there and studied for two and a half years with the spiritualist developing in a meditation. I went to the Arthur Finley School, um, which is Stansted, where they train mediums. Um, I went to all the churches. I didn't go to England to go look at the castles um, in London or go see the Queen. I knew I had a mission. And that's how it, that's how it started. One thing led to another. And, and there you have it. And one thing led to another. And uh, a book, you know, I mean, six books, television, radio show. I mean, it's, I still, get, I, I never set out to do this work. But usually people who have ability that strong, you're going to see it as a kid. You're going to, there's some type of sign that something was happening there. But some people are born with the high potential for this work, and some people aren't. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, oh, and by the way, I did say, let me just help you out. I did say psychic and mediumship. Let me just finish that sentence. So a psychic rose, as I'm looking at you, um, I'm reading you, your aura, your past, your present, your potential future. I don't think it's all set in stone. So as I'm looking at you, I start to see things, some colors. So I'm reading your aura. I'm not getting the information from the other side. When mediumship happens, I'm not with you anymore. People on the other side start to come through. So psychics perceive, mediums receive. Mm -hmm. See, there is a difference. So Absolutely. I learned, and I had to learn the difference between both. And I teach my students the difference because it can be kind of hard to say, is this psychic or is this mediumship? But luckily I got that education. When I went to England, they're all about evidence. Evidence. You can't give that foo foo, you know, uh, oh, with your mother's hair, your grandmother's hair, she's brushed. They, they are very evidential, uh, evidential mediums to prove the continuity of life. And that resonated with me. And that helped me so much. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think what you just said then, that sort of um, is testament to the, the number of, um, and I don't want to necessarily go down the, the frauds um, sure. kind of path, but, but that is sort of rife in, in your industry, right? You know, there's a lot of people claiming that they have these abilities when they don't. So how, how would you, like, for our, for our listeners, how would you yes. um, suggest that they go into a reading? You know, you don't want to go in skeptical, but you also don't want to go no. in, you know. Yeah. So um, A couple of years ago, Hay House, my publisher, called me. All right, everyone knows I'm usually. Mm -hmm. um, they said, so do you think you have another book in you? I thought I was done. Mm -hmm. I thought, I mean, because how many times can you say the dead are alive? How many times can you say it, right? So I said, okay. So that was Hay House's way of saying, you really need to write a book. Okay, so I said, well, what are people asking for right now? And if you notice, a lot of people, there's two words, uh, there's mediums popping up everywhere. Um, the word empath is huge now, and the word soul. And I said, okay, so 
I wrote the first part of Bridging Two Realms, Learn to Communicate with the loved ones on the other side, um, for people who are, who are about to lose someone or have lost someone. And from my 20 years of doing this work, I, I wrote about what happens before somebody passes away, during the process, and after. And then I go into, so you are looking for a medium, and I always tell people, always word of mouth. And I break it down for, for, the, for the reader, and I also break it down, if you want to be a medium, if you want to be a medium, this is what, with, with my education, this is what you should be doing. So I always tell people, um, bros, go by word of mouth, okay? The medium shouldn't be asking you questions, okay? Not like this. Sometimes I'll ask a question, but it's really a statement. Like if I said to you, Rose, um, did you lose a grandmother? Yes, I did. Oh, she's right here. You just told me yeah. she passed away. The medium should be saying, I feel a grandmother figure. I feel like she's making me aware that she's on your mother's side. She's talking about she has three daughters and your mother is one of them. She, there's a, a sibling of your mother's that have, has passed. That's with her, you know, evidential, all right? And it's okay to work with the medium, um, but it's usually yes, no, I don't understand. And the media may get something that they, they don't understand. It's okay, because people are afraid to talk sometimes. They're like, can I say something? I said, yes, as long as I gave you the evidence first. Um, it should be evidential. There was, there's all kinds of mediums. Where some are very heart-centered, some are in your face. Um, and it shouldn't be general. Uh, it shouldn't be something like this. Um, uh, I'm picking up someone who passed from cancer. Who's that? I don't know, you're the medium. You tell me who it is. Do you see what I mean? So I can be a tough teacher. I can have fun with my students and, I'm, and I, I, I can play with my audience only to keep the energy up, but it should be evidential, mm -hmm. all right? Evidential. And not everyone's gonna be the same uh, in their work, but they should give who the person they're linking with, what's the relationship, how did they pass, and maybe what was the age that they passed, how long ago, and then more information should be coming. If you're talking to someone's mother, Okay, if you were really linking with someone's mother, you should be getting information that that child would understand. That's, um, it's, and some stuff should come through, Rose, that only the mother and the daughter could have possibly have known. Mm. Do you understand? Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you, you mentioned your students then. So I just want to talk about, you know, yeah. your teachings and your, and your courses and those kinds of things. So let, let's look at um, be, being a medium or honing your psychic abilities. So if you're not born with the the gift, the medium gift, can you can you um, sort yes? Of get and you that? know what? Too, I mean, you all know who John Edward is, obviously mm -hmm. down in Australia. You know the man, and he's a good colleague of mine. Um, he says that, um, and I I like his word, and I always give credit where credit is due. I, okay, th these are his words. He doesn't like to call it a gift. I will say it in my soul work. Okay, empower the soul. We all have gifts, talents, and abilities. He, he says that he doesn't like to call it a gift because it means that he has something that you and somebody else does it. We all have the potential for this. I was born with the high potential for it, um, meaning it was already there, whether it was in the past life or I was, I was born this way, uh, where somebody, they, they feel like they're supposed to be a medium or get into it, they have a lower potential, meaning they have to just work harder. We all, I used to say two rows in England, I was trained by the mediums. I heard them say, mediums aren't made, they're born. And I went, wow, mediums aren't made, they're born. And I went, and I started to believe that. But then as time went on, I saw that people who weren't born with it or have a low potential for it, um, just had to work harder and they can be just as good. It just takes a little more study and a little more work. Yeah, but we all have it. We're all born intuitive, Rose. We all are. How old is your son that you said? How old is he? He's one. Oh, bless. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, so kids, as they go around four or five, all right, they're playing, they're coloring, they're running, they're laughing. I think they have one foot still on the other side and one foot here. Everything is joyful for them, you know, hopefully. And then they start school. Kids are born with that right side, the creative side, the drawing, you know, and kids see the world as it really is. So if your kid is saying something, um, listen to your kid because it's probably the truth, you know? Um, so when kids go to school, they're about five, six, however old, they start, the left side of the brain comes in because we have to listen to the teacher, understand math, spelling. So that, into, that creative, beautiful right side gets pushed aside. 
And we forget about that psyche. It gets so pushed aside and life has a way of doing it too. Because as you get older, you're supposed to trust, trust logic, logic, not that intuitive stuff. And it's funny, isn't it funny, Rose? You could say the word psychic, people are like, oh, mumbo jumbo. <laughs> when you say intuition, they're like, oh yes, I have that. See, it's just a word, yeah. yeah. So um, everyone is born with it. And I think it's a calling, Rose. A lot of people, um, I believe that a lot of people are touching the realms on the other side lately. I think the consciousness of man is changing. Um, some people said, John, is it changing or is the veil on the other side getting thinner? I think our consciousness is, uh, we're changing as a race. All right, look at the world. I mean, you know, we're very sensitive creatures now. And some people don't even know that they're intuitive. They just think that, why am I uncomfortable around people? Because you're empathic, do you understand? So I think that people are sometimes, you could be with a friend, Rose, right? And somebody could say, say there are two friends and one friend's, God, I keep hearing the name, Jake, Jake, Jake. And the friend goes, that's my dad, he passed away. So the person who says that, like, starts to see, maybe they're touching the other side. Does that mean you're gonna be a medium? Does that mean you should go be a medium? If you're good at plumbing, does that mean you're gonna go be a plumber? Or if you're, you see, maybe, maybe the ability is getting heightened uh, in us. Maybe it's for your own sake or for those around you. It doesn't mean always, to go be a medium. And if you're going to be a medium, it's a life of service. People forget that. It's a life of service, not to be a star. Okay. I never set out this to be like, look at me. All right. Um, so it has to, you have to feel the calling for it. And if you feel like, no, I really want to help people. That's the number one answer. When I ask my students, why are you taking the class? Why do you want to be a medium? It should be to serve, to help mm -hmm. people, uh, as many people as I can. Yeah, absolutely. So for those people who do feel that calling, do you have any quick, I don't know you've got a whole course on this, but do you have any quick tips that you can give people just starting out? Um, understand if understand why it's happening. You are the vessel. You're, you're one big psychic antenna, whether you're in, you call yourself an intuitive, we can't help it. You, everyone can walk into a room. They know if they don't, something happened in the room. You know when you don't, you meet somebody for the first time, Rose, you like them or you don't. You know, so understand how is that happening? Oh, it's intuition. How is it happening? It's happening because your aura is expanding. Their aura is blending with yours and it hits that certain psychic reception area. Understand the mechanics of how it works because doing this work, it makes you very sensitive. Um, and the price of sensitivity is sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Do you like that? So some students are like, this is making, I'm so sensitive with this work. Well, welcome to doing this work. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So I say, learn the mechanics of how it works and try to get a hold of quiet in your mind with some type of meditation. It doesn't mean ringing a bell or a gong or lighting incense, singing, oh, Madi, pod me. <laughs> it's just quiet in your mind. And if you can't sit and do one, do a walking meditation. Look at a candle, do one with the breath. Look at a mandala. There's many, you've got to still your mind. How can any intuitive information, never mind the other side, come into your mental space if there's so much noise in there. And isn't there a lot of noise in our heads lately Absolutely. between what's going on in the world, technology, emails, bells, whistles. So yeah, mm -hmm. understand the mechanics of how this works. Understand that your psychic faculties first. And then if the medium shift, then you'll understand how to turn it on and how to turn it off. You should be the master of your abilities. It should not be the masters or not be the master of you. So when people say, the students say, I can't sleep at night, the dead people are here, I see them everywhere, then they're untrained. Yeah. You, I, I do not walk around seeing the dead, okay? It's, it only happens because I train myself when I'm supposed to do this work or a strong spirit's trying to get my attention to do something give a message yeah I, I think that's an interesting point as well because a lot of people do assume mediums just walk around bumping into dead people wherever they go right. so so that's a really good point now I just want to go back to what we were talking about about children having one foot in and yes. one foot out of the other side and it, it sort of goes back to what you said about your childhood you know being psychic or a bit spiritual or woo woo uh, it it wasn't really accepted, but I, I actually think as we move forward and like you're talking about our consciousness is opening and our awareness and all those kinds of things. Sure. How would, wh what would you go about saying to parents who have Beautiful identified? God, I love you. Good interview, <laughs> girl. Yes, you are. In my book, um, I think it's, <laughs> I, I think it is the spirit whisperer. There's a whole section for teachers and parents for the kid who's sensitive, for the kid who's saying, mommy, there's an old man in my room. Mommy, I'm seeing lights. 
mommy, or the kids waking up because they're seeing something. And I'm not talking about night terrors. That's a whole nother thing. I always tell parents and teachers, um, you get an education first on how it works, so you can teach it um, to your te- uh, so you can teach it to your child. If a parent understands, okay, there's three abilities: set, clear sentient, clairvoyant, clear audience to hear, feel, and see, or clear cognitive just to know. If they get an education of the mechanics, it's going to be easier to tell the kid. Never, you know how they have pageant mothers in the pageant mothers, I guess you have that in Australia too. Yeah, absolutely. The ones that push their kid and, you know, and it's just a little girl. Let, let your kid be a kid. One time I met a couple of parents. This happened some time ago. The kid was very psychic. The kid had to be about 10, 11, 8, 9, 10, 11, something like that. And the mother was like saying, show them what you do. It's like, let the kid be a kid and tell the kid that it's um, nothing to be afraid of that it's a natural ability like playing music, art. Um, they can't, they might not have to, they don't have to tell everybody that they're sensitive, but it's a gift actually. That kid can use that ability in school, life, uh, whatever, and play some games with them. What I think it is too. Ro, do you have any other kids? No. Or you have, no. Okay. Just one. All right. Say you have a five, six, seven, eight, it doesn't matter, little kid, all right? Say you have two kids or a friend. Um, a good intuitive game, because you don't want to tell the kid to shut it off. Mm-hmm. right? But you can show them that it's not scary. You have two kids sit back to back, right? So someone's sitting behind me, a kid is, say I'm a kid and the, their back is to mine. You have three crystals or three marbles or three crayons in front of them, all the same color. Tell one kid, pick one, hold it and see if you can send them to, uh, you can send what you're holding to the kid whose back is against you and see if they can start matching up the crystals. You see the teach, that's telepathy. Yeah. And if you have a child, and this is a good tip for you, Rose, when your kid gets around four or five, if your kid's very sensitive, which they all are, mm-hmm. um, you can teach your kid to turn down their lights. What do I mean by that? So you, we have energy centers, right? It's the spiritual batteries. We're physical beings and spiritual beings. So you know, Rose, about the, the third eye. You know about the throat center, the heart center. So if you teach a kid that we have like these special buttons, all right? And you could tell, you could, before the kid goes to bed, if the kid is young enough, all right? Because some kids, they're like, you know, don't touch me, all right? You tell the kid to turn down their lights, their forehead light, the throat, the heart, not shut off or close down, all right? You never want to tell someone to close down their throat, scent, see? Because I'm also a hypnotherapist too. I mean, I, you don't, that's, you know, it's the way you word it. Tell them to turn down their lights or to close the, the flowers if it's a girl. It's going to make the kid less sensitive. And they might not even understand it, but by them just imagining a color getting smaller in a location, I think it's actually going to help them be less receptive. You're not, mm-hmm. You can never shut down an energy center, but you certainly can, can dim it or heighten it, uh, heighten it um, when you need to, or it happens on its own, actually. Yeah, absolutely. And I think on the flip side of that, we're, we're talking about parents who are supportive and maybe too supportive, over supportive. But what about the the children whose parents are, you know, devout Catholic or, you know, obviously you've spoken about your your parents being Catholic, so I'm not sure how they embraced it. But what about the parents who are definitely not on the spiritual side and the, and the kid almost feels like they have to come out or, or hide their abilities and those kinds of things? What would you say to those kids? And these are probably, you know, older kids, teenagers and those kinds of things. Um, yes, it's like I had to, because I was made fun of, I just kept it a secret. All right. Mm-hmm. But i like, I really believe Rose, what you put out, you get back. I really believe in th- what you put out and you get back. Um, and it's hard if a parent, especially if there's a religion or religious faith that goes with that. All right. It's like, I think that the kid, um, the kid could do his own research. Um, but you know, the parents find the book. It's hard, Rose. It's a balancing thing. Um, there are other places where kids could look. Now, every kid's on the internet now, too, though, uh, but you got to be careful, all right? You don't, because you don't know if what group you're joining or something. I think if that kid puts it out there, I think there's going to be, a, I think there's going to be more kids. Say you have a 16 year old, a 14 year old. I think there are more kids around him or, or her that is into this more so than you think, all right? I think if you, if you, what you put out, you attract. So, it's okay to share it with your friends that you can trust. Share it with your friends and they'll be like, oh my God, I felt a certain way. I didn't want to say anything. Stick to people that you can trust that, um, that yeah, 
close friends. I only could tell close friends. So yeah, that's a that's a good one. I mean, I don't get off in that ass, Rose. That's why you're number one on numero. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, but I would tell the kid uh, or the teenager uh, that um, no, if they have no one around them, if they can read something, or um, as they get older they'll be able to find their path or where they're supposed to go. The soul even knows where that child is supposed to go and it'll try to lead it um, to, to the people and situations in their life for its highest good. And that actually links back to what you were talking about before about synchronicity and, and things sure. you know happening to, to lead you on this path. So let's talk about you uh, again, about, you know, was there, was there really any other path for you? Was there what? Was there really any other path for you career-wise? Um, do you mean how it came to be or how I followed it? Yeah, I, I, I suppose. I mean, could you, could you have ever seen yourself in any other no, industry or career no, or anything? No, the, the, I always was like this I, and the accident. And I believe that your soul, the real you, your true essence, pure consciousness, not the person you look in the mirror and see, that's just your body. You are a soul. You are a soul that comes with the body, not a body that comes with the soul. You're a soul that comes with the body, not a body that comes with the soul. You were so long before you came here. You're going to be so long after you leave here. I believe that uh, to, your soul tries to get your attention in this life through dreams, intuition, synchronistic events, but we don't pay attention to them. Like I was living in LA. I was a young man, not doing what I was supposed to. I had those signs come to me. All right. Um, you know, living a life of, in my late twenties, you know, you know what it's like. Okay. Living in LA. Um, and then I had the automobile accident. It, it was raining that night. That was my wake up call. I didn't, I didn't complain. I walked away from a car rose that was crushed the whole front of it. And I walked away without a scratch. Mm -hmm. Now I could have just said, Ooh, lucky about that. And then went right back to the kind of life that I had. I knew I looked up to the sky, God, the universe, he, she, the source, and I just said, thank you. Never complained, never complained. Um, there was a relationship that I was in for uh, six years that should have ended a long time ago. It just wasn't, I got my life together and I got my own place, the relationship. That's when all the ability started to happen. And I started to follow the signs. The ability happened. And then I was invited to England. How could I go to England if I was still working? Who's gonna pay my rent? My, I worked for a flagship hotel. The flagship closed. I have the time now. And I said, how am I going to go to LA? How am I going to afford my apartment? Even though it was small. A friend of mine from, uh, I lived in LA. She called me from Boston. She said, Johnny, Debbie said that you want to move to England. I want to be a writer and move to California. If you go to England, can I rent your apartment and pay your rent while you're gone? And I went, oh my God. So it was <laughs> like, stepped on the foot, met, uh, met Simon, got invited over. My work ended. She took over my apartment. I got to go to England and here's a, here's something now that if someone be like, it's a coincidence. No, I don't believe in coincidences. Now, you know, Rose, um, you've traveled outside the uh, Australia. You know, you have to get a visa sometimes, right? So in the States, we let people stay here for six months. No, if you go to England, they let you stay there for six months. You got to leave the country, stay out for three months, get a new, you know, then come back in. After doing that a couple of times, I was say, I said, I don't want to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. well, I wish I could stay. My friend Simon's uh, colleague said, John, apply for a student visa in my company um, and you get a year visa. So I get, I, I applied and I get a letter in England and it says, dear John, it said, um, we cannot give you this visa because the US is not one of the countries that we honor for this type of student mm -hmm. visa. And I said, oh, okay. So there it is the letter now saying, no, I can't have it. But in the envelope was the visa, <laughs> a full visa for a year with my name. And it was embossed. So I had a letter saying no, but in the letter, but in the envelope was the visa. Now, come on. So do you think that I called immigration and said, oh, did you make a mistake? I kept that visa and I got to stay there. And then I was on the show Unsolved Mysteries got a hold of me. I went to Boston. I started to get a name. Then Hay House found me and, and I was signed with them in a month. That's not right. I mean, writers hate when I say that. It was all meant to be one thing after another, after another, mm -hmm. because I was following the science rows. I followed what I was supposed to. Now your soul tries to so show you a lot of things. We, lots of times we turn away from it, don't listen to it, or don't even know it's our soul trying to get out your attention. Your soul might be saying, 
here you go. And you give it a kick in the ass and say, you know what? No. Yeah. So I followed, I trusted, and things just started to happen. And if it doesn't happen for you, it just means that it's not happening for you right now. Um, there's, then there's another door that's going to open. Yeah. So one yeah. thing was, it was just, I could never see this. And I started, and I, I know I, I started doing readings one-on-one. -on -one, and then I said to um, someone, I want to start doing readings of 10 small groups. Well, that didn't happen. I went to a bookstore. I, did, I started doing people of 30. Then I was signed for Hay House. I went from doing one, one-on-ones to 30 to 800 to 2000 to over 3000 people with the Hay House audiences. And I had to learn in my, in the people on the other side, you can't be in front of an audience of 3000 people and say, I have a father here who passed from, it ha you have to, you gotta have be so accurate to single out that one person out of 3000 mm -hmm. people. So I feel like those on the other side were training me. So I can go to an audience on a good day and just go to somebody with some outrageous evidence. Um, I was in Arizona and the audience was 2,100 people. And I said, I'm coming to somebody here. I have a grandfather who's coming to his grandson and he's talking about in his casket, you put the chest piece in his pocket and in his casket. And in my head, I'm like, oh, damn. Just, and in my head, is somebody gonna, is, oh my God. And sure enough, a kid raised his hand. I always make sure I said, so let me get this right. You have a grandfather who passed and you put a chess piece in his pocket in the cast. He's like, absolutely. I said, can I ask why? He said, because he taught me chess. Now I don't know chess. And I said, well, what was the head? What was the chess piece? And I guess it was the, the highest one. Is, is it the queen or the king? I don't know. Okay. And, um, and then it went into the message. So there's not too many people in an audience of 2,100 that put a chess piece in their grandfather's pocket. So that's how I work with bigger audiences. So it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that that's really interesting. You mentioned on a good day. So do you have bad days and what does that feel like? Um, it's, I always, I, I, I never beat myself up. After doing this work, either, sometimes they're stellar. Sometimes it's good. I can walk away and say, that's the best that I can do. It's not just up to me. I'm always fascinated by this. I, I never say, I told him I got the chest peep. I, I, no. Was, I, was it me or was the information given? I give those on the other side the credit. They're the ones that are giving me the information. I am just the vessel. So when I hear people say, well, I did this, I got that. And I, I say to them, did you get it or was it given? You see? So um, it's, three, it's, it's a three-way link. It's me, the people in front of me, or the client or the recipient, and those on the other side. It's a three-way link, all right? So... I know you can see me here on YouTube, but on the radio, from spirit, the people, you know, on the other side, through spirit, me, my own spirit, to spirit, from spirit, through spirit, to spirit. And when everything's in sync, if the audience is in good form, I'm in good form, they're in good form on the other side, there's all kinds of audiences, Rose. I walked into some audiences, you know, and I might be in a, 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 a conference hotel where there's like cement cylinders, no energy whatsoever. It's up to me. I got to get that energy up in the uh, up in the audience because the way it works is I raise my energy, those on the other side lower theirs. Mm -hmm. Then there's a blending process, you see? So I tell people, if you're going to be a medium, you have to be the maestro and conductor of every sitting you do or every demonstration you do. And of course, I'm nervous. I, when I was in Australia, twice, I love you people. <laughs> All right, it's kind people, and I miss Australia. I did Sydney, Brisbane, and Melbourne twice, okay? I was down there with Deepak Chopra, Marion Williamson, uh, Robert Holden, Denise Lynn. I love it. It was with Hay House, Leon. It was my first time going to Australia. Um, I was in the States. I, of course, I was nervous. Different country, different people, different history, different ways, different references. So I just imagined that I was on in, in the audience. I was on stage in Australia because I believe in affirmations and visualizing mm -hmm. and as if it was happening now. Um, so I saw myself on stage. I saw the messages flow and I saw the audience clapping. That's exactly what happened. I walked out there with a couple of thousand people. I said, hello, Australia. And it was just beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if the audience is in good form, the medium's in good form and those on the other side, it's like a, it's like a perfect cocktail and, they, and it's beautiful. But think about it. Does the audience influence it? Yes. If you got if you got an audience all arms folded or people brought people they didn't really want to be, that's kind of hard to work with. But um, I just do my best, Rose. I don't beat myself up. I have an education. I know what I'm giving, 
and I know how to work with someone who says no, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. How do you manage people's expectations? Because I imagine a lot of people come there with the expectation that their this specific loved one is going to come through to them. And it doesn't always happen, does it? No, I have my speech. After years of doing this, I have my speech. Um, I always tell people, um, if, if I now you do it on Zoom or I'll do it in front of an audience when we go back to that, I'll say to people, remember, I use a little humor. I know, Rose, losing someone is not funny, but it raises the energy of the room. To see a mother smile for the first time in months since her child passed, and sometimes people feel guilty laughing or smiling. Um, they don't want, uh, people on the other side, they want us to go on. They want us to be happy until they see us again. We're the ones that are still, still here. So I'll tell the audiences and um, I'll say, how many are here, you're hoping to hear from that one person. You want that one person to come through. Of course, all the hands go up. I said, okay, let that go. I said, because I am not in control of it. It's not one 800 dollar daddy okay? It's, um, it's, I don't know who's gonna, usually they get who they wanna hear from, but if you're focused on your mother who's passed, but you have an uncle that wants to come through or a grandmother, or if you're married, that mother-in-law may come through. And people are like, but I paid my money for my people. I am not in control of it. They are. Um, you never know who's going to come through. So I say, just be open. Know who your people are on the other side as best as you can. Um, and all I say is, is expectation is listen to what I'm trying to say. That's why when someone says no too fast, I'll be like, let me help you with that. And then on a good day, I'll say, you know, your husband's side, he's lost his mother, correct? And Rita is his, is, is the mother's sister. How could you? So if the medium just stops and gives and breathes and doesn't get nervous, if you're talking to a spirit on the other side, you should be able to go back and say, they don't understand. Give it to me in another way. And you get the answer. So I just say, be open. Um, I know they have expectations and I'll say, just relax. And I always say to the Rose, um, if it's a one-on-one -on -one or a small group, if, if it's not working 10, 10 minutes in, I end it. Mm. I can't, you don't fluff it. No charge, no worries. They, I'd rather be respected that way and then, and then try it and then have them come back and try it again because it's not always going to work. It usually does, but every once in a while, it might not be the right time for a reading for somebody. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Is there a reason that one person would um, show up uh, over another person? Say, for example, I was coming to you and I was saying, okay, I want to hear from my grandfather. And then my uncle showed up. You know, is, is well, there a reason? I think um, they, they some come through, and if if you give the if you listen as opposed to just the evidence, I used to be very evidential based. Okay, I still am as best as I can, but there's more of a message there. Why is this person coming? Why? Mm -hmm. So if, if a grandmother comes through, say your grandmother comes through um, on your mother's side, and her and your mother's brother is here, that grandmother might come through to you to tell the mother to keep an eye on the brother. There's always usually a reason, okay? I had, I was doing a small group of eight once. Some people get, and I tell the audience this, sometimes you may get someone who you don't wanna hear from. Um, if it's so emotional, I tell the people, look, if it's too hard for you, I can, I can just drop the phone, cut the link. Mm -hmm. I said, but usually, so I was with this uh, group and I looked and I gave the evidence. Uh, I, I, I don't forget what the woman's, I'll just say Helen. I said, I have a woman here named Helen. She's talking about esophageal cancer. Uh, I said, would anyone, would you want to, I feel like there's a mother connection. I, and I said to this woman, I was drawn to, I said, would you understand that? She goes, yeah, I know who she is. What does she want? And I went, oh, and I said, I said, is this like a mother? She goes, it's my mother-in-law. The mother-in-law was not nice to her the whole time she was here. Uh, she was still married to her son, the woman, Helen. And she just didn't get along with the daughter-in-law. Um, that mother came, that mother-in-law came through to apologize, wow. to apologize how she treated her. And that's all she wanted. But who opened the door for the rest of the night for her? The mother-in-law. The mother-in-law was the one that stepped forward who started off the reading. It's almost like, I, I always play and say, maybe the mother-in-law is on the other side saying, can I go first? I have to apologize. Then I'll open the door and let you all in. <laughs> The mother is the one who started off the reading, who set the tone for the rest of it. And she started crying because the mother never apologized to her. The mother-in-law never apologized to her. So that's special. That is special. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's so funny. As we're talking, John, you, you, we spoke at the start about why you got into this and why other people should get into it. it it's to help people. And every sure. story you've told, it's, pretty, it's showing that that is just the theme that runs through everything. Yeah. 
And yes. Hector, it rose many years when I was in the, before I moved to LA, I was on that show. Um, I, I started getting really known fast. I still kept a day job. I keep saying that because I don't want people to quit their job mm -hmm. until they have, until they're established. I was tired emotionally, physically. Um, uh, it, it was a lot spiritually. I was just exhausted. And I said, can I keep doing this? I questioned it. I questioned it. Every time I questioned it, a parent who would, a parent who needed help, who lost someone would step in front of me or come to me somehow, some way. And, um, I, I walk and when the reading's over, it's just a little slap in the head from them to say, you know, with the greatest respect to say, <laughs> And then I, when they, when that reading happens or a reading like that, I say, okay, that's why I'm doing this. So here it is. Uh, let's see. I was, uh, oh, okay. So 44, 50, 20, 25 years now, over two decades. And somebody said to me the other day in an interview, so John, how do you feel about being a pioneer in this work? And I went, oh, what? Pioneer in this work? I felt that it, it made me feel old. <laughs> okay. I don't say old. I say old. I'm like, Really? And he goes, John, don't you consider yourself a pioneer in this industry? You've been going since. Then. And I thought about it. I said, well, I guess I am. If my first book came out in 2003, 17 years later, which freaking me out. All right. So, yeah. So I'm honored to do this work. Um, and there's a lot of work, too, that people don't realize, too, Rose, that I do for free. I do a lot of animal charity work where they get the money. And I got one coming up, too. Uh, I helped raise $145,000 for animals to have surgeries. Um, for the local uh, animal shelter, yeah. Oh wow, that's wonderful. Do you have yeah. any? Um, do, you, do you get people to donate to that? Because we could put some links in the show notes. Yep, it's um, it's it's in what they're doing is I don't know when this is going to play, but the event is in December in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, there's a raffle. Um, I'm going to do a Zoom live. I usually do something every year in front of people for them, but they're going to do a Zoom uh, where I'll do a, an afternoon of clairvoyance where you come on. I'll get to see you. And, the, and they're selling raffle tickets for like uh, five bucks or 10 bucks for a chance to have a private reading with me. And, and if, if, it's in the, if the timing works for, mm -hmm. before it airs, I'll, um, I'll, then that's great. But, Absolutely. Um, we'll be publishing yeah, this I, Friday, so I'll definitely put those links in for you. Yep. You have to give back, Rose. You know what I mean? Absolutely. You have to give back. I'm an, it, I am so blessed by spirit that I can do this for them, that I can, that I can have a life doing it, teaching and writing and doing this work. Um, you have to give back. I am a I am a big believer in what you put out, you receive. I don't put out. I don't give to get. It's the universe will take care of you anyway. So, but um, when when numero, uh, it's numer when, you, when your company, all right, it's numerologist dot com. Numero yes. Yeah. Um, I was flattered because I was, I was I tapped into numerology years ago, and I always say to students too. Once you understand the way numbers work, you will never look at the numbers the same way again. I keep a number eight in my wallet. Yeah. Yeah, I do, you know, for and, abundance. And do, do you know, it's really funny because before we, we um, came on, I was just talking about my, uh, my non-spiritual husband who this morning uh, woke up feeling very anxious about work. Um, and he asked me to pull a, a card for him. And I actually used your um, card deck. And I, like pulled, arrow. I pulled the number eight for him which is yeah. crazy. I didn't know that you, uh, so let's, let's quickly talk about numbers. We've not got much time um, left, but how sure. do you use numbers in your practice? Well, um, I use them in, I use them personally. I'll look at numbers and my favorite number is 149. Um, I, I see that number everywhere, everywhere. Now you could, you know, you could numerology, you can add them up. You could take the one, the four, the nine, you could reverse them. Every time, and, and I thought it meant to play that number in the lottery, all right? So after like spending so much and I'm like, okay, <laughs> I noticed that that number comes up when I'm about to do some either psychic or mediumship work. Now I'm not superstitious where I have to see that number before I do it, but I noticed that number and you could add it up to nine and 10 and uh, okay, 15, six. Um, I, I try to focus on what was I just thinking before I saw that number. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, John, what does 1111 mean? Well, it breaks down to four, which is foundation, or they call it the angel number. And I try to tell people too, what were you thinking just before you saw that number? But I use numerology. Um, I'll say like this, somebody Rose, I'll tell people, it's a great way to have a jump, in, uh, to jump into a reading. You, you could give me a color or I could give uh, um, three numbers, just really quickly, Rose. Give me three numbers at the top of your head. Three, six, nine. 
three, six, nine. So three, meaning family, unity, trinity, six. And six is like schooling to me, nine. Would you say nine? Yep. Nine is endings, okay, um, for the new beginning. So there's some type, and I could look at it as here too. You got the three, the family, you got the middle. And six, five and six for me, numerology-wise, there's always a weird number. I can do one, two, three, four, the eight, nines, and 10. I always look at <laughs> five and six as a balancing number. Like it's right there in the middle, yeah? So you're balancing your work. That's the nine. Um, and I would take that nine, not in a bad way. Some things may go away. I don't know what other job you work, Rose, or, or is this your main job or is there something else? I feel two jobs. I feel like something, you'll always stay, you know, luckily, guys, she's staying right where she is. Okay? <laughs> but there's going to be something else here. So um, family is important, the learning. So it's either a balancing family and work right now, because you got that little kid, right? You said it's one, uh -huh. right? So it's balancing work. And I think the nine, I think something is going to be end, uh, ending to make room for something else. So that's how I'll jump into a reading um, on the radio. Um, I just love looking at them. When I see addresses, I look at it. I look at certain dates and I'm not so superstitious sometimes, but if I'm doing a special event, or something, I will what I will see what the 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 day, the month, and the year comes to. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh perfect. I have a site, my soul community, that I launched and the membership was closed. It launched on a one. And I said, okay, great. And I and I didn't even plan it that way. I said, Oh, I didn't even do the numbers on it. Mm -hmm. But Glennis McCants, she's a media, she's a numerologist. Uh She's, she used to be a stand-up comic. She was on my radio show, Hey House, for a number of years. She really got me into, uh, she can do numbers front and back and so fast where you're headed, your, you know, your, your soul number, where you're going. So I love numerology and you will never, and I've never looked at numbers the same way again. They're not just numbers to me, neither are colors. You are so right there. I think once you know what's like how to, to do the numerology and add them and make the sum and all that, those kinds of things, you will do it everywhere. So anybody listen to, listening to this who hasn't sort of looked at their own numbers and those kinds of things, I'm going to put a link in the show notes right. to, to find out about that. Can I say one more thing? I'm Absolutely. a four, I'm a 22, okay? A master number. There's oh, 11, 22, and 33. Yeah. I can't, now think about this. For the people who are listening, you know numbers. So the master number is 22. I can't elevate or go there until my four, I have a solid foundation. Mm -hmm. And I say that. If my life is solid, my work is solid, I'm solid, I can resonate to that master number, that teacher number, do you understand? Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone ever told me that, it just makes sense, you know? It makes sense. And my friend, uh, Simon, who I stepped on his foot, not only is he a four, he's a Virgo. So yeah. he's all about um, structure, bullet points, Excel spreadsheets, and he's a Virgo. So talk about detailed, you know, <laughs> luckily he's, now, the, isn't it funny, Rose, the gentleman who I stepped on his foot, over 20 years ago is my manager. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, you know, because you have the one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. the guy I stepped on his foot, he's my manager all these years later. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So. All right. Well, John, it has been so nice to speak to you. I could literally speak to you all day. I could talk to you forever. <laughs> so thank you so much. And uh, anything people, I'll give you the link about the Coda Fund, anything you want, just go to johnholland.com. Um, and there's a lot of resource rows there. The site tells you where I'm at. It's not just about me, though. If you need help, there's bereavement sites, stuff for children, um, um, a lot of organization, therapists. It, it's all there for you. So go to my frequently asked questions. And, um, you know, a lot of people can benefit. But Rose, you're a love. So thank you so much. And I'm honored to be on this, uh, to be part of this. So thank you. Thank you. Hey, numerologist community. I hope you really enjoyed this podcast on Numerologist's YouTube channel. You can head to the link in the description if you want to listen to this on iTunes or Google Podcasts, and you can subscribe there too. If you love this video and want to see more, make sure you subscribe to our channel as well.